Good evening, everyone. We are here for another evening with, and tonight we have Tommy Yashin with us. Good evening, Tommy. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, thank you. Very You're well. looking really well. I'm loving the shirt behind and the medal, everything fantastic. I just, uh, before I start, I know Freddie Abrams is going to be in the chat, and I just want to say a big thank you to Freddie because uh, Freddie's you know, been arranging all this for us. So thank you very much, Freddie. Um, we're going and to thank you, Tommy, for being here and spending the evening with us. Yeah, thank you very much to Tommy, of course. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's wonderful to have, have you MC. with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about Tommy's career um, with Blackpool, but we're going to start off a little bit before he came to Blackpool. Obviously, you know, we had wonderful times at Blackpool. It was probably, as Blackpool fans, it was possibly the you know, the greatest period in, in Blackpool history, really, with the, you know, with the... Steady on, we did win the FA Cup. Yeah, we did win the FA Cup, but I mean, in the recent <laughs> history of of things that we can remember, because we don't remember the FA Cup, obviously, but my, my dad did, bless him. Right, so the, the our first question, I'm going to put it up on here, uh, is when did you start playing football? And when were you first picked up by Aston Villa? How did it all come about? Because Right, well, initially, my dad was apparently so a decent footballer, which he continues to tell me uh, locally and um, obviously so I used to go and watch him and um, you know go and get playing with my uncles and you know just basically play part football and then obviously going to school you get involved in um, the district team the school team and the district team and then you end up going to play for the county where you know people start noticing you so from I was quite fortunate at um, uh, a quite early age I I got scouted um, quite by, you know, by quite a few clubs. Um, so when it came to <clears throat> when I was 14, 15, 16, I was trialing at Leicester, Chelsea. I went to Norwich, Coventry, you know, quite. And then Aston Villa. Um, so we was playing in like the, the sort of games and we was training and I was going up to Bollymore Heath, which you know, it was a stress on my family to get me there on a Thursday night. And then again, on a Saturday, which I thank all my friends and my family and aunties, uncles, mum, dads, stepmom, stepdads, you know, that they, they all just <laughs> used to in and take me, which, you know, very, very you around. Yeah. And, it, and it's costly, you know, and at the time you don't get paid for it, you know, so it, you know, it, it's a big ask for them. And, you know, they did it for me because they wanted for me to achieve. And I remember my parents and, saying to me, Tom, what if you don't make it as a footballer? I, went, I, I am actually going to be a footballer. And then my parents say, but if you don't, I said, that doesn't come into my equation. And luckily, fortunate for me, I had the decision of, to go for a few clubs um, after like trialing them all out and basically going for a few different trials. And then I sat down with my family and said, you know, where do you think I should go from here? And I was tempted to go to Leicester, Newcastle and places like that. And I thought, you know, literally in Northamptonshire, um, I, I thought it was beneficial for me to go to uh, Aston Villa, where I, you know, I actually had some really good, I actually made my debut there, which I know if I'd say it all the time because it's my little claim to fame. I've got to get it in there that, you know, I made my <laughs> debut at Aston Villa yeah. when uh, John Terry made his debut for Chelsea. Oh, so, you know, oh. that, is, that is, I know John's probably, and he's actually ironically at Aston Villa now, so it's, quite you know ironic really but yeah. i know he's doing a lot better than now, but you know that's <laughs> where i am that's how i started to be honest he's never played for blackpool though tommy no yeah you certainly have so what age were you picked up by aston villa then did you go yts I, then? was it like a yts at aston villa yeah i sort of played um youth team uh so you basically do the youth training scheme um where i moved i left school obviously at 16 and I moved into a family uh, in Sutton Coalfield um, it was quite you know and and then I did my two years apprenticeship it's quite you know ironic that it's, it's it's very you know moving away from home at 16 is a big thing but I think it makes you into a better person and then you go through I, I was explaining to one of my work colleagues today and uh, he he was saying well, what did you have to do and we were sort of like we had to be up we used to get forty pound a week, you know, when I was a YTS. Oh, yeah. and that was what it was, and yeah. you got a bus pass and a train pass, and that was you. And you lived with the family, so they fed you and kept you. You had this forty pound a week to. I don't know what I did with it, but you know that's what I did. But you know, and we'd have to get from 
uh, the, my digs on a bus, then get the train and then get to the training ground. And I always remember our youth team manager was like really, really ruthless. And you had to be in and on the bus by 8.30. He had the radio. And when them beeps went, if you wasn't on the bus, wow. he'd just drive past you. And then you had to get a taxi for 40 pounds to the tra- to the training oh. ground. And that <laughs> was. And then you get there and clean the boots and then you get involved. With, yeah. Which has changed now, which I believe, which is, is sad. Sure. It makes you into... I know, character to be them. Do you know what I mean? Character building, really, isn't yeah. it? And you know, you know, sets you on the right path. And you know, and of, of course, you'd be determined at that time. You know, you'd already said you're going to be a footballer. You know, you you were focused on it. I, I would imagine you were the type of lad that you know didn't go out partying all the time, and you're really focused on what what you were doing. Maybe, <laughs> maybe talk about that later. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, 2000 2001 you were a very early steve mcmahon signing so how did all that come about and when did you first hear the interest and in, and was it an easy decision at the time obviously a big move for a young lad to come from the midlands Even further up, away from home up to the pleasure beach and all the, all the attractions of blackpool can you tell us a little bit about how it all came about yeah, I remember um, my uh, youth team coach, Kevin McDonald, uh, Aston Villa. He said to me, look, we've got a bit of interest for you. I'd obviously played my, made my debut and, at Villa and I was sort of, I'd made a few subs. I didn't get one, but I was like sub for a few times and didn't really, didn't really make the break really, if I'm, if I'm totally honest. I didn't, I needed that little break breakthrough and it didn't happen. And ironically, it was Alan Wright who did used to play for Blackpool. Oh, wow, yeah. That was keeping me out at Villa. He was just... Uh-huh. So consistently good and you know he never got injured and obviously he did in one game but then he didn't and then going back to your question it was um the youth team manager was used to play for liverpool kevin mcdonald so he had a sort of connection with steve mcmahon where he just said to me look i've got blackpool coming to watch you tonight they're really interested they've watched you a few times what do you think and i went blackpool do you know what i mean it's like <laughs> wow <laughs> I was away from home. It was, you know, and I, it was a big decision for me. And I was, he said, look, they really want you. They're going to pay money for you. And for us as a club, it is sort of, it, for what they paid for me, I think it was about 50 grand, which basically would pay them back for what they put in for me, investment sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? So it was from yeah. that. And that's how it happened. He came to watch me um, and just said, look, they're coming to, if you want to, you can go and sign and play for them at the weekend. So this was on the Tuesday or Wednesday and uh we played he said yeah look and i was just like please just don't get injured please just don't get injured do you know what i mean because obviously i was quite injury prone as it goes and i right. uh, was praying that i didn't get injured so that's how it came about he just sort of said to me do you want to do you want to are you interested and i said look i need to make the next step in my career because i could see it coming to a halt there where i was playing more or less every uh reserve team game which was great because you got to play against a lot of decent players in that but from that, I just thought, you know, I need to make the next step now and, and go into man's football as it was instead of uh, youth team and that sort of football. So it was just... Yeah. Cool. And it was a great decision, wasn't it? It wasn't <laughs> at first. We'll actually talk about that in a minute. The okay. first season wasn't quite as, didn't quite go to plan. But uh, just before we go to the next question, if anybody, uh, I know we've got a few people watching now, if anybody's got any questions for Tommy that you want us to ask, just pop them in the comments and we'll, 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 we'll get around to those for you. Yeah, we, we have actually, we, we'll, we'll try and get to them. I mean, I can ask one now, actually, just a very quick one, I suppose. Eugene McGeever was in early with her. Uh, who was the joker in the squad when you were playing in your playing career? Well, unfortunately, it was me. I, <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Yeah, um, and I'm sure if you spoke to a few of the other lads, you know, I used to uh, you know, play the Joker, which I didn't really go down well at school because I used to be the class clown at school and then obviously carried that one into the dressing room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, unfortunately, it was me. So what sort of things did you get up to? What's your prize prank? <laughs> well, just silly things, really, I suppose, where, you know, cutting people's socks if it was you know and then putting dp in people's pants and <laughs> we stayed in hotels putting buckets of water up against the door and knocking on the doors and then lads, <laughs> lads of ours opening up and just cutting their faces <laughs> and just you know just stupid little lad things i suppose which were quite humorous at the time straight yeah. out of the beano <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> i'm sure that was great for morale and everything else i'm sure you know you were very popular 
Um, we actually noticed because because they had um, Simo on the uh, the football show on Friday on Blackpool, and uh, he mentioned you in, in in the brief bit that they said. You know, he did mention Tommy Yashin as one of the players there. So you know, they obviously remember you as being a, you know a lot of fun to be around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my next question uh, was you, you signed at the time of uh, Ablett, Richardson and Newell um, do you remember those and what were they like to play with, do you remember those players what did they bring yeah, to the dressing they, room when they came in yeah they, they were like big names and like Kevin Richardson was at Aston Villa as like when I was doing my youth team he was actually there so yeah. I knew from from there and actually I, when I first came up to Blackpool I lived in the Hilton on the front for a good few months <clears throat> and obviously because they were on loan they used to stay there Obviously, Mike Neal didn't because he was sort of local Liverpool sort of the way, so he used to come in. The, but and Gary Ablett again the same. But yeah, they were big names, and like me coming from, I can you know big names coming from like a big club that I came from. So it was like wow, actually you know they are signing some decent players, and he's looking to take this club to the next level, which for me was really good. Mm. Yeah, definitely was. Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna touch on this first season, obviously, because. Um... It was a bit of a disaster. Uh, we, <laughs> well, a lot I've, of a... I've never forgiven Richie Wellens <laughs> no. for getting sent off at Oldham to, to get us relegated on the last game of that season. It was my first. I was going to all the games. So I actually saw every game you played for Blackpool, Tommy. I was going to every match at that time, and and I just remember that was my first relegation. And 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 when Richie Wellens got sent off at Oldham, when you know we'd been winning, I just I never never ever forgave him for that. Uh, so did you forgive him? Did did the team forgive him? Because obviously it, it, fans who don't know about this, Blackpool needed to win at Oldham to stay up. Well, one nil up. Richie Wellens gets sent off in something like the seventy fourth, the seventy fifth minute, and then it's it's just carnage coming at Blackpool coming at, and they scored in virtually the last kick of the game if you remember it was virtually the last kick of the game and it sent us down and what was the dressing room like after that game and how did you feel how do you feel and did Richie Wellens come in for a... for me it was very like difficult to take because obviously although I was at Aston Villa it was sort of reserved team football so there was no not meaning in it, but you know, winning meant something. That was the, the thing I, I noticed when I come to Blackpool. It was like the fans were passionate, and f to win a game was like, wow, this is three points we're playing for now. It's not just to make yourself and better your career. And I mm. remember playing that game, and it was like we was doing okay, and it was a tough game. We got the goal, we were winning one nil, and I think I actually got nutmegged when the lad <laughs> went down the wing, and he nutmegged me to cross it in, and they scored, and I was like, oh, no, no. We done. My career's over, do you know what I mean? And oh. oh, why did we mention this? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, don't watch that. Don't watch that. I just, oh, no. Dressing room, nobody, we just all walked in the changing rooms and it was just silence for about 15 minutes. And Steve McMahon just, I remember him walking round and yeah. round and round. Oh. And it was sort of like, no one dare speak. Everyone just oh. had their head down, almost like, you know, where do we go from here? And and I think from Steve McMahon's point of view, it was his morale boost. And he was like, right, lads, how do we all feel? And nobody dare say anything because nobody knew what to say because, you know, a lot of the lads had never been in that situation before and I hadn't. And obviously I was just sat there thinking, oh, please don't ask me because I just I just felt so bad. I felt responsible. And I was yeah. sort of like, oh. it, was, it was mad and... From it wasn't that, your fault. It was Richie Wellens. Yeah, we don't we don't remember you being at fault. We remember it's Richie Wellens. So, so if that makes you feel any yeah. better. <laughs> so, you're not yeah. remembered in Blackpool folklore as being the guy that was nutmeg to send us down. Don't worry, it's Richie Wellens getting sent off. So you're all right. <laughs> I, just remember, I think Steve McMahon said, "Look, lads, this is a learning curve for us all. Do you know what I mean? We need to like yeah. we can bounce back, but it's how we bounce back. It's how we do through the preseason. It's what we do now." between coming back and now I'm quite confident that we can get promotion and, you know, and we, yeah, I remember we were, we were back the pre-season and everything was still a bit like, oh, this is like, but he was like, look, it's gone, let's go. And we moved on. And obviously that's when any, to be fair to Steve McMahon, he built a great little team. He, he, he really did. And yeah, from my playing career, it was, you know, really, really brilliant. I, I really enjoyed my, my career basically revolved around playing at Blackpool and you know yeah. a, a lot of my best memories are Blackpool. Blackpool. 
yeah. But still, we'll be, you know. And we loved the, the team, you know, I, I'll tell you now, you know, we loved Steve McMahon at that time. You know, we just loved the whole thing. We had a we had a wonderful time. So you were part of a great part of our history. So it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful contrast, actually, because just prior to Steve McMahon, we'd had Nigel Worthington and it was just the worst. And mm. I think it was only two and a half years, but it, honestly, it felt like about 20 years. It was like really, really bad. So, so, so that spell, you know, coming straight after Worthington, it was it was it was really special. Really was, yeah, a, special it was a, time for a real big shock for me. Obviously, coming from the surroundings that I've been used to, and then I like pulled up at Black, uh, Bloomfield Road, and I was like, "Wow, this is like this was before the, when the old ground was there." You see, yeah, so it's when the the club shop was on the bridge, so we had the tangerine bar over the road. And yeah, there, and I remember going in, and he went, "This is us," and I was like, <laughs> "Wow!" And then I remember he was right, "You're in." The sign of the contract, and he was like. We'll take some pictures and I'll show you around. And I remember going to the dressing room and there was like a bar. And I was like, what is this? This is, this is crazy. Seriously, what I've come to here. Yeah. I was like, I used to oh. share the bar with 15 lads, but you know, it, it was what it was. And we sort of got on with it. And I was like, and then we got, I always remember, you know, I remember we had, you give me a blazer. Yeah. We had a, a navy blazer. We went, right, again, you get a tie. And I was like, I felt like I was back at school. I think I was <laughs> uh, Nigel Worthington's very top. It was like really long on my arms. I was sort of like, oh, this is what it was. And I was sort of like, this is a new era for me, wearing boots to games. I was just used to getting tracksuits. But yeah, it was uh, an hour like pulling up at Blue for Road. Let me tell you that for the first time. But yeah. Well, what did you think when you saw Squires Gate for the first time? <laughs> well, that's another matter. It was like, it, you know, water cabin. And I was like, wow, this is, this is real football do you know what i mean and, but i always remember it's funny enough you should say because obviously the first day i pulled up it was john hills that come and met me and he was right. like hi right where are you from i said oh, i'm tommy blah, blah. and he was like all oh, right what well, position did you play and he was like i said oh, i'm left back and he went ah oh, uh, i played there that's my <laughs> position i was like this is really awkward <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. i built up like such a great playing relationship on and off the field with John and you know it was it's was surreal that it was John that I actually met for the first time who again yeah. is a true but Unbel unbelievable uh we were just going to touch on this Jane's got a question here for you which is did you go on the St Kitts tour have you got any memories if you did and any funny stories you can remember going on that St Kitts tour did you go on that I don't think I did no okay no I don't think that was my you know that must maybe before was it I'm not no, it was the start of the season after we got relegated. So. Maybe I did. I've lost track of that. <laughs> no, okay. Can you forget going to St. Kitts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> yeah, there you go. No, I, unfortunately, I cannot remember that for the life of me. So. Oh, okay. Oh. You must have had a very good time if you did go. Because <laughs> <laughs> never no fun, are they? Do you know what I mean? It's Okay, well, well, we'll go on to something you definitely will remember, and that's a 7 0 thrashing at Barnet first game of the season. They just get happier, these uh, questions, uh, yes, by they, the way. Yes, they do. And uh, also, going, we're, we're going to try and get, get rid of the bad times and, and, and move on to the, obviously the glory times. But obviously, there was a 7 0 uh, drubbing at Barnet and uh, also going out to Yeovil in the FA Cup. Can you remember? Were you part of both of those games? I. <laughs> This is a real bad story for me, and it doesn't set me in good stead. So, oh, oh should we move on? <laughs> I'll never forget the start of game because me and John didn't play in this game. Right. So they played Roy at Barnet, and they went down the night before. And obviously, me and John were both injured at the time. John Hills, this is. And I'd never, I never, we recall, and it, this is, no, no. So, we basically, the physio said, Look, I want you to go to the training ground on the Saturday morning. Yeah. And we was like, okay, do your circuit. I'll set you out, you know, injury prevention, all that sort of stuff. We went through that. And afterwards, me and John went out. We said, come on, we'll go out for a few beers and watch the game or watch the Sky Sports coming in, a few drinks like that. Anyway, me and John actually ended up having too much to drink and staying out too long. Right. So we watched the ball come in and we're watching it. It's one nil. We looked at each other and went, should we go home? It's like, nah, come on, we'll have another drink. Two nil, three nil, four nil, five nil. Six nil, seven nil. So we're sat there by this time. We've probably had seven pints because we're thinking, Oh my god, we're what have we done? We should go home because you know this isn't going to set us in good stead. So we ended up staying out and we get a call about nine o'clock. Oh. Hi, it's Phil Warner. Um, everyone's in training tomorrow. 
make sure you're there. <laughs> the very time we're on our phones, doom, doom, probably in the tower lounge, giving us a punch. We remember, and we remember it very well because somebody on the Blackpool fans had wrote on the, you know, was it called Seasiders or whatever it, where, where, where it was? A view from the tower. The idea, something like that. And it was, I remember it was John Hills and Tommy Ashton out in the Tower Lounge, not only drunk, but both paralytic and Blackpool <laughs> lose seven. Oh, no. <laughs> right, I think we've had four or five hours sleep, and we're going, we're in trouble. We're, we're in trouble. So we've walked into Jeff's office, and he's laid down, he's gone, bang, bit of paper on the table. Read that. Were you out last night? Oh, yeah, Gaffer was, you know, just had a few beers in the, the Tower Lounge watching the results. And well, I beg to differ, he said, because look at this message. And then he went, <laughs> Uh, I'll expect, he said, I can do one or two things. I'll go to the chairman and find your week's wages. We were like, but we haven't done anything. We didn't lose six, six, seven. Yeah, we were, if you hadn't been injured, we might not have lost that amount. I was like, oh, that's not going to help. <laughs> oh, no. I'm 250 quid and had to slap 250 pounds on the manager's oh. table on the morning. And uh, oh, we actually God. had to go running from, do you know where the training ground is to the Lytham Pier? Both of us on the Sunday morning, both plodding along with hangovers, and yeah, cost a lot of money that day. So I do remember that game very well, and I do remember getting knocked out of the cup. So yeah, it's got a couple of different memories for different reasons in that game. <laughs> right, okay. Let's just go to the viewers' comments, see if we can get something out of it. See if somebody's got a really good yeah, question for you. Because we're, we're killing you at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, let's have a look. Let's get, yeah, we got some here. Uh, Someone's shocked that you stayed at the Hilton and yeah. the Oysters paid for it. <laughs> yeah, Mark Porter's saying it. Oh, you, you lived at the Hilton for a few months. Some of the Oysters thought he was hearing things. <laughs> that wouldn't no, normally well, happen. I, I, there's a story on that alone as well. But when you when you sign for the club, you get like a relocation fee. So when you're moving from different clubs, I think the PFA fund it. So you get like a bit of a relocation fee. So they they say to you, you can do it, you can put it towards staying over, or you can put it towards a deposit for a flat or something like that. So I was in the process of buying a house. So I stayed there while this house was having done renovating right. or built, whatever it was at the yeah. time. But yeah, so I did actually pay for it myself, but which is I did stay there longer than I intended, which is not fun. But yeah, don't believe that. The oysters wouldn't have paid for that for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, to be honest, we weren't believing it anyway. So, uh, but yeah. Peter only Peter only says you played for Blackpool three times at the Millennium uh, Stadium. Which game was the best one to play in, in your opinion, of the three? It's a question I haven't. I haven't got. That. It's a good one. To be, to be honest, it was weird because obviously. The one, the one childhood, you know, dream you have as a boy is to play at Wembley. Now, that is one sort of thing that I do. Not, I haven't got no regrets, but you know, to play at Wembley as a boy is is like your dream. But obviously, because Wembley was being built, and we were fortunate to play there three, sorry, four times. You know, we, I was just gutted that it wasn't at Wembley and it was at the Millennium. Which, listen, it was what it was, but they were fantastic days out. And you know, we've got. We created so many memories between lads and, you know, it was so easy. I, I, I wouldn't like to pick. I remember playing against Cambridge, who I ended up playing for in the end and giving away a penalty um, in the game where I'm sure Blackpool fans remember that Steve McMahon hadn't got out the tunnel and Barnsley had fallen over yeah. and they'd scored about 30 seconds. The playoff, seconds final. The playoff final, tell me that was, yeah. It was a playoff final. So that was the game okay, we ended up winning, but obviously we obviously... Barnsley got a bit of stick for that, but you know, that was like that was a good game to win. Obviously, after going down, the managers walked out the tunnel, gone to shake the other manager's hand, and we're kicking off again after being one nil down after <laughs> didn't set up a good oh, no. from that point of view, it was it was you know, but listen, to go to there three three times and win three times is a fantastic achievement. You know, it is really, really so yeah. If I had to pick one game, I, I don't think I can. It was just, it was weird because obviously one game you played with the roof on, the next way to get the roof was off. So, you know, we became regulars there over the time I was there. So it was quite, we were quite fortunate. We had the home dressing room. So we was really, really fortunate to win there as well. So it was, yeah, I wouldn't like to say, but all three times occasions were fantastic. 
I'm sure they were. I'm, I'm sure they were. I, I, I'd imagine probably promotion would be like that. You know more of an achievement especially after that season and especially you know you being the you know the lad that got nutmeg to send us down so it was it was good to get it was good to get us back up a division would i not would you not say <laughs> yeah I suppose so. it's promotion. obviously with cup you sort of you're playing all year for you know the league and then that's where you get sort of you know your bread and butter is your league but so probably yeah if i had to pick one it would be the promotion year that yeah. we won so yeah probably um sean p says here we are what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you playing for blackpool funniest that's a trip i don't really i can't really answer that i've got a few stories when we played at bristol um obviously steve mcmahon manager we went down to play and uh we traveled down and we got stuck in traffic so usually when you get there the plan is train friday morning on the bus train uh, the bus down to bristol yeah. stay over friday night get up go for a walk um and then we were to the game saturday so the friday we're on the track on the sorry on the bus on the way down game of cards as usual bit of fun with the lads get stuck in traffic jam we're like oh no traffic anyway we get there i share a room with barnsley the goalie where um what's for dinner oh, boiled chicken rice pasta beans because we've been stuck in traffic this boiled chicken was now like a hard budgie oh. so we <laughs> so we get to the, we go down like oh, we, bear in mind we're starving so we get back to our room the man's like a little bit of a prep after the game look to lads tomorrow this is their danger man this is what we've got to do bang on it tomorrow good night's sleep no room service where is it sorted you know nobody messing around cards at eight o'clock everyone to bed me and barnsley go back to her room and look at him and went wow oh, that dinner was horrendous he's gone yeah i feel the same and we're like what and we're going, should we order some food so we pick up the menu burger and chips now nah, we can't we've got a game tomorrow room service hey uh, can we order two burgers and chips please and two uh we didn't have pints, by the way. We had two black currant uh, waters. Anyway, look, don't say anything to anyone. This is reception. Don't say anything to anyone, please. Just bring them up. We'll pay cash so that nobody knows we've had them. Anyway, we're there in our rooms. Next half an hour. Door. Room service. We've gone. You get it. No, I'm not getting it. No, you get it. No, I'm not getting it. Barnsley goes to the door. There is Steve McMahon. Oh, no, no. Burgers and chips. And he's and two of these black currants. He's gone, I don't think so, lads, but make sure you pay the bill on the way out. And we were like, no. oh, <laughs> so we've been rumbled. <laughs> Luckily, we won. And obviously, we didn't get where well, he got bought up in the team talk. It was like, we're stopping at the, uh, the shop on the way home. Tommy and Barnsley get off and buy all the beers for the lads because... <laughs> Otherwise, you're in trouble. And we was like, okay, no worries, we got off. But yeah, that was probably a funny story that happened to us. You could, how's your luck? He, he obviously must have been walking past reception, asked the, the 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 guy that was bringing up the food, where's that going to? Room, whatever we were in, and there he was, stood at the door. Oh, poor minute. <laughs> oh, dearie, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you were in trouble a few times, weren't you, Marlon? I can imagine yeah, yeah. he was quiet. You know, he was quite um, a scary bloke, I would think, McMahon. Or, or was he not quite as scary as he kind of comes across? But I would have he, he was, he was scary. very scary, very scary manager. But he was fair. You know, I remember him Friday mornings. It was sort of, um, uh, they used to have rest of the world, which obviously me being Polish named. I was in the yeah. rest of the world. There, <laughs> and Scousers and some man. So we were playing. The Scousers were... We was always rubbish. So their final was the Scouts versus the Manx. We we were all around the edge watching, and uh, the Manx start winning. Richie Wellens and Bushel and that started putting their hand over the face, hopping, saying, "We've won this. We've won this." Next thing, the ball gets played into um, Steve Bushel. McMahon goes in, bash, clatters in, stands up, and goes, "No one takes the Mickey out of me like that." <laughs> Steve Bushel was out six weeks. We were like, "Gaffer, it's Friday afternoon." He went, "Train as you play." He said, "If somebody's taking the Mickey out of you." That's what happens to him. Don't let anybody take the mic out of your honor off the pitch. I was like, next thing you know, fills out and the, the stretches out. And Steve Bushel was out for six weeks and he was in our starting lineup for the Saturday. This oh, is a no. great. We were like, so yeah, he was a hard man. He was a hard task. <laughs> Bloody hell. So it's, oh, 
God, wow, frightening. That's a story, bloody hell. Right, <laughs> we have a question for you here. Um, you play with players uh, like Danny Shitu, Danny Coyd, uh, Simo, Brett, and Merce. And what was it like playing in that team? You know, when it started, obviously it got off to a bad start, uh, you know, with a Barnet game. But we started coming, didn't we? Probably around Christmas time, was it, where we really started to get our act together? What was it like it was, playing in yeah, that team? Kidderminster. Kidderminster. Kidder James, I don't know if you remember that, but what, what what was it like playing with those guys? Kidderminster, was it? I think it might have been actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my, my best. Uh, it was hard. We had a great team and we had a good squad, and and that was the thing with us that anybody that came into the squad didn't weaken us at all. And I think that was credit to Steve McMahon. You know, everyone. If you got injured, you know that you had to fight for your place back, or if some. And that was where he was quite fair. If he put you in. He'd say to you, Tom, look, you've played today and that isn't acceptable what you've played like. Not very often, but <laughs> <laughs> he did say, Tom, that is, you know, and then he'd pull you and say, Are you okay? If from the right and say, oh, just a bad game gap. And he'd go, no worries, that'd be it. You go on, you play, you're fine. But if you had two or three games, he would hoist you out and say, and he would tell you. But then again, he was fair with you. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You're playing well, you're playing. And that was it. And he kept a strong seat. But like the likes of Danny Shitsu, Danny Coyd, Simo, Brett, Merce, all of them players were really, really in influential to us and really good, good, solid players. You know, I couldn't, you know, the two strikers we had, even when Scott Taylor came, you know, they were real good, great, great strikers and knew where the goal was. Like Brett and Merce, there was no better pairing in the league, you know, and, yeah. and hence why, you know, I was a bit, John was a bit more of a Division One, Two player where he was big, strong, win the headers for Brett. And, you know, you probably look at him, Brett out of everyone has done, better playing for the Southampton and teams like that, you know, but fair play to him because he worked his socks off day in, day out, game in, game out, and nobody, you know, would never ever take that opportunity away from him because he deserved that, you know, yeah. and the likes of Richie, Richie Wellens went on to play for Leicester. What a great play. I know you probably think you never forgive him, but <laughs> to be fair to Rich, he did do that, but a lot of games he won for Blackpool when I was there, you know, single-handed. He was really good pulling the strings with Keith Southern in midfield with Danny Coyne and players like that he, he was rich was you know technically our best player i think i feel in that sort of era he was anytime he was in trouble he'd say just give it to me and you know rich was really really good player really for us what was uh southern like in in training because he was hard as nails wasn't he Blimey, he was terrifying i always thought he was a really hard player he would he took no prisoners at all and no, was like that in training or <laughs> yeah he did and and he was you know from being a midfielder, that was Steve McMahon's sort of type of player. As for Richie with a bit more flair, he knew he had to have Richie in there because you need a bit of bite. And, you know, although Richie wasn't scared of putting his foot in, but, mm. you know, with Keith, he, he was solid. You know, he was Northern lad and Geordie and he, he didn't have, he didn't stand no prisoners. You knew if you were going in for a challenge with him, if you don't go in properly, you're going to get hurt because he, he tackled properly and fairly. You know, which can't happen these days. I think he'd be sent off more times than he would. <laughs> yes, he would. He would. He was, yes, yes. He did used to go in pretty hard. Uh, but, you know, Blackpool fans loved him for that, obviously, yeah. you know, for that passion. Right, we're going to go to happy days. We're going to cheer you up now. So okay. we're away at Darlington for the last game of the season. I don't know if you remember. And we needed to win to get into the playoffs. I think, if I remember rightly from... I was there. We were also relying on a result coming through. The fans were on radios and stuff on that day. Uh, we won 3-1. Yeah, the result went our way the other way, and we were in the playoffs. Can you remember what it was like in the dressing room after that day? Get yourself into the playoffs on the last game of the season. I bet that now that was a must have been something different. Yeah, that was you know fantastic. You know you, you've and to get to that part of the season where you need to win and you're relying on, although you want to get into the position where you're not relying on anybody else. We really just thought that we've done our job now. What more can we do? Do you know what I mean? But if yeah. it didn't work. You sort of then start looking back of oh what if we'd have won here Tuesday night away here you know yeah, if we'd have sure. you know if I'd have blocked that cross they wouldn't have scored and you know you start but like from that the momentum was there we were on a winning run and you know to go into that game and win three one and get to the playoffs is we were like wow we've sort of we've snuck in so let's go yeah. to the next level now and, and and you know and win this you know win the playoffs which you know fortunately for us it was good times and it was. It was what it was. But yeah, from the, the dressing room point of view, it was fantastic. The lads buzzing and jumping around 
as per you could imagine. Matt Marm wasn't pacing round and round and round and round. He was, uh, I suppose, he was over the moon, was he? It's, uh, it was. Hear that, hear that one with one with his top and just <laughs> laser and tights. You knew he was happy when he started doing that. You were, you were. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well we had a two-legged semi-final with hartlepool which i um, i'm sure you can remember we, we had them home uh, first and then, and then away do you re do you remember that game is, is there anything particularly you remember from those two games i mean it was very loud at Blue bloomfield road and the if, if you remember the hartlepool manager blamed the blackpool fans for putting his team off a bit because we were so loud and we only had half a we only had about seven thousand in, but there was. I don't know if you remember. It was it was deafening that night. Games like that, you know, the crowds come out, and it, you know, you stand, you run out on the pitch, and you know, from a football's point of view, you sort of switch off once once you start. You know, when you go out there and the fans are sharing and cheering names, and they're like that's brilliant times, and you sort of get to the point where you switch off and you think, right, we've got to do a job now. We're here to win this football game. So you know, although you're still conscious of people watching it it's sort of your, your mindset is you don't hear everything that's going on but two tough tough games you know real real tough nitty gritty down to the wire you know scoring Brett's you know it, it, and everything sort of tactics go out the window there it's sort of like you've got to win and that's you know it's like that Steve McMahon used to say to you you've got to win this game it doesn't matter if we play horrendously and sneak a goal in the last minute it doesn't matter just defend properly and we know we'll score goals. So we were sort of like, you know, and that was the one thing we had. We had a decent defence, Barnsley in goal, although he was prone to the odd clanger every <laughs> now. <laughs> we fair to him. <clears throat> he was solid and we felt solid with him behind us. You know, I can't, you know, you can't fault him and great, great and great team spirit. And I think, you know, with the spirit we had and McMahon installed that, that was one of his things. He'd be like, we'd go to places like Kirk in prison and train with the inmates and it'd be like Tuesday, we'd do like something called the Dirty Dozen and all the inmates would be with us and we'd be like, this is just nuts. But then they'd help us all out and just, you know, and it, the team spirit was there because of the, the sessions that he put on and the bonding sessions that we had. Everyone was everyone was prepared to go the extra mile for their mate and not. If you were having a bad time, we'd be like, look, I'm getting skinned a few times here. Drop out and help us and it'd final. Just, you know, and, and that's the team spirit. And that's why mm. we were successful because of one, his management skills and two, the um, you know the team morale that we had, but yeah, two absolute fantastic games, you know. Yeah, uh, then we get to the uh, later, you know, to the final. Uh, we, we've already touched on it already a, a little bit about you know I was going to ask you about the disaster start. We we did have one of these with Brett a few weeks ago, and he was saying that um, as a team, even though you went one down and you, you pull one back, and then you you went down again and you pulled another e equaliser back at half time, that. As a team, you just knew you were going to win. Now, that's what he said to us. He said, you know, the, the team just knew they were too good for Leighton Orient. And were you feeling that that way? Do you have any memories of, of, of that yourself thinking, you know, it doesn't matter if they score, we're just going to score more? I, I touched on it basically there. I knew, like, we knew we'd score goals. The attacking force that we had, we always felt confident. If we could keep a clean sheet and that was our thing to do, nine times out of ten, we'd win a game because Brett would pop up with a goal. Simo, Hilsey... You know, all players like that, Richie, uh, free kick or whatever, we knew we'd score goals. Big John would get one in at the back stick. <clears throat> so from our point of view, that's something really good to have to hand. You know what I mean? That we could say, look, we've got a goal behind, but we know we're going to get back into this. Just relax, do what we do, stick to the game plan, you know, and we will win games. And, and, and we did, you know, nine times out of 10, we, you know, you're going to have off days and you're going to have somebody banging in a 30 yard, but he used to accept that to a yeah. certain degree. He'd still say you should have closed him down, but, you know, we're like, yeah. Gaffrey's put it in the top corner from 30 yards. What do you want to do about it? And he'd say, well, get closer to him. You know, that was, that. he always had a comment. Like, it's, if you was ever late for training, he'd be like, you've had 24 hours to get here. You're like, Gaffrey, the M, M, M25 stuck bumper to bumper. <laughs> you've had, to, you know, you've had 24 hours to get here. Just put your money in the pot and away you go. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, going back to the, the memories, we did have a great team. And, you know, there's no denying that. Hence why we had success. Did your family go to watch you in the finals? You know, with yeah. mum and dad there and everything and family? Yeah, yeah. All my parents, my uh, mum, dad and stepmom, stepdad, all my aunties, uncles, you know, I, and looking back, my sisters and their kids and my niece and nephew. So, you know, they, my, my, my eldest daughter, Millie, she was born in Blackpool. So ah. 
she's like she was, yeah, she came on the pitch with me so from my point of view you know it was fantastic days out and you know you you can't recreate their memories you know their memories that will last last for me especially you know my daughter's probably too young to to appreciate that now i've got four girls you know um you know but fortunately my youngest daughter now uh, so i've got four girls i've got millie izzy poppy and uh, mia and you know the, the age range is mia's one poppy's four izzy's 12 13 and millie's 20 this year so 21 oh, massive but like fortunately from my point of view i would love them all to share my memories but obviously i can't i've not got that now but yeah my i, I just felt like from my point of view my family coming to watch me at millennium was not payback because i i just like wanted them to be proud of what they'd help me do they'd help me achieve sure. yeah they've all been part and of each it one of them like my aunties and uncles and friends of the family that you know took me to the aston True. villa on tuesday night wednesday night my uncles my family taking me to wolverhampton on a sunday morning when they've got families of their own you know i just felt all them coming to watch me was look thanks for everything you've done to me i'm just repaying not repaying you but just trying to you know it was more like a, a thank you from me if that makes sense yeah, it does totally make sense completely because, you know, yeah. it is a lot of commitment. Um, my, my son's with SE Fire Academy and there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you've got to run them around and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I can it just imagine. makes them feel proud. You know what I mean? They're like proud yeah, sure. of what we've helped him achieve that. And, yeah. you know, and sometimes it's nice just to have their, you know, their memories to look back on. You know? Yeah. I'm sure they loved it as well. I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, sure I'm sure they were very, very, very proud of you. Right, right. we're going to take you on another pre-season tour. I wonder if you remember this one. Oh, if you went on it, we don't know. Uh, the next season, you went on a pre-season tour of Scotland. You, you took in Air, Partick and Clyde. Are there any stories in that? Do you, you remember, remember it? Do you remember it? Or is that another one you didn't go on? <laughs> no, pre-seasons are just not my thing. I, you know... Tours are tours. Are, tours are great at the end of the season when you've won and you go for a few days away with the lads. Pre-season tours are very, very, you know, you're up at so and so, you're drinking this amount of water, you've got training. So pre-season tours, I, I just, I was like, oh, it's just going to be so intense. But yeah, I know as a player, you have to do them. And if my theory was, if you miss pre-season, you struggled for the rest of the season because you never get the full intensity of training as hard as what you do with your teammates as where if you miss it and you're on your own training it, it's very very difficult to get that yeah to catch your know, fitness back up to where you should be because if you miss a chunk of it so pre-season yes i do remember that one funnily enough but i've got no stories to tell it because it's just basically train eat yeah train, sleep train eat train sleep play a game do you know what i mean and, and that's as regimental as it could be. I don't it's think not a, it's not a holiday is what you're saying, basically. Right. It, it, it's serious. And so, so, okay. See, it's completely the opposite for me as a fan. I mean, I love pre-season yes. tours because I've got that hope and that excitement and you get to see the new players and you think, Oh God, you know, he could be <laughs> the next best thing. And you, you just, you just love the players more pre-season than, than maybe when, when you watch them and, and you realize, Oh, actually, you know, we're not, we're not going up this year, but you've got all that hope and, and excitement at the start of the season. That's, I love about pre-season like, yeah. and, and it's a lot more friendlier aren't they do you know what i mean you go away and you're playing against yeah. them and everyone's talking to you as where when it's a league game you're not interested in their fans and everyone's interested no in yeah. no it's very friendly but it is really good it's but yeah when we, we are drinking and not training so i guess it's, it's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, us, it's it? a different but yeah we we you know the last season we went to barrow pre-season and they had a game with afc files and it, it, it you know it, it, it was wonderful times we did videos on it and, and we met ian Everett as well which we may, maybe somebody uh, may ask you about him uh, because he was the manager at barrow at the time we interviewed him after the game what was he like as a, as a player because he was a did you, did you play with him did, did you play with Everett? I did. Oh, he might have come in after yeah, you. Like, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you who was there. I'll tell you who was there when you Martin Bullock. Do you remember Martin Bullock? I remember Martin because for the fact he played right wing and I yes. played flat. And when we had a training game, I just used to think, please, Martin, don't knock it up because he was like a little whippet, wasn't he? So he was. we had team shape i'd be like look mine i know you're going to be able to beat me because i know it's never the quickest but and i don't want to boot him because steve mcmahon just said to me one day why don't you just tackle him i went gaffer i don't want to tackle him because i need him for further i need him for our game on saturday but yeah but he was he was really 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 although he was two foot three he was something <laughs> you know, and I he was he, he was 
Mine was a really nice lad, really, really nice lad. Just kept himself yeah. to himself. Didn't do nothing silly. Just bang, take on players, crosses in, goals. Do you know what I mean? So Martin was, yeah, real top lad and a great player. Yeah. He was part of, and I'm going to remind you now of the games. We had an, the LDV run. We beat Stoke 3-2. beat Mansfield 4-0. Chesterfield was a 3-0. Oldham, we beat them 5-2. So you had a payback day at Oldham <laughs> for them sending you down. And then we went to Huddersfield. We played Huddersfield. Uh, we beat them 3-1 at home. And then we lost 2-0. And the game went into the golden goal. I don't know if you remember it. And, of course, we're talking about Martin well, yeah, Bullock. Yeah. So, do you, I don't know what you remember of that run, but I'm sure, just like every Blackpool fan, you'll probably remember that golden goal from Martin Bullock. It was. Do you remember that? I don't think the rule had actually been in that long, if I remember. So the golden goal was sort of like, what is this? Do you know what I mean? You played, and you, and all of a sudden, you just, as a defender, you're almost bricking it because you don't want to make a mistake. You think, look, I can see bad things happening here. If I try and play it back to the goalie, it gets cut out, and he's. Everyone's getting tired and, you know, the game's getting to that stage where, you know, yeah. you are getting tired. And and I just remember Bully just go on, score, please, just score the screen. You're like, oh, I just drop to your knees and think, you know what, fantastic. You know, I, memories like that, they don't go away from you. And it, it is great. And then obviously, you know, you've got the fantastic day out after that. So it was for us, it was new suits and away we go. We had two separate reactions to that golden goal because I, I was one of the Blackpool fans that was going absolutely mental because the minute the ball went in, the game was over. That was it. Yeah. End. And I was just going absolutely mental. Jane, on the other hand, you tell... I was <laughs> absolutely furious because um, I've been to all the games on the cup run. You know, I've been to Chesterfield. I've been to Mansfield. Like on freezing nights, there was no one else there. And we'd won brilliantly, like really heavily, scored loads of goals all the way there. And then to get to Huddersfield and I think Barnes he did something bad at the beginning of that game as well, didn't he? And um, just for them to put us through that torture <laughs> that during that game, I'm just like, up. it's been so easy all the way here. We've been coasting. Like, why have you put us through that? I remember running down to the front at the end of the game when Bully scored. Like, how dare you put us through that? How dare you? I was absolutely fuming because we just coasted there. I was going mental. I was with every other Blackpool fan going absolutely off my head because you knew you'd won. You know, there was no coming back from it. You know, the, you, you could go. You know, sometimes you can score a goal and there's still half an hour to go. You might not win, but the golden goal, that for me, it was... I, I was just, fun. If you lose on it, it's... it's, it's oh, oh, I can I imagine. imagine it's awful, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go to a viewer's comment here. Hi, Sean P. Sean P is saying, uh, Tommy, did you ever meet Jimmy Armfield at Blackpool? Did he ever give you any advice to help you in your career? Jimmy was um, <clears throat> always at the training ground. I always remember Jimmy, he always just sat... On the leg right on the leg press you can never get on it and it like i injured my knee and i was like oh jim can i get on that he went no not yet so i'm still doing my leg weights and just sort of like okay jim, I'm just trying to get fit for the weekend but you know <laughs> great guy great guy and he was always always positive in what he said to you he'd always finish and although he would say something to you that maybe not negative but like look i think you could have closed him down but what a great game you had after that he'd always finish with a, a, a positive sort of yeah you know feeling on what and this we'll go and win this game saturday so he, but he was always in and around the training ground you know because oh, obviously he only lived didn't he just on the streets behind or yes he did yeah. the ground. so you know jimmy was yeah. always about never really seen on match days didn't come down to stress me, but always around the trust always round not the just from in the gym with phil talking to phil and phil horner the physio and you know but yeah it was advice wise he, he's you know he'd been there done it and obviously he was a blackpool legend so you know you listen to what people sure that's that's yeah. what to say and you take it on board because you know he'd been there and done it so yeah it was, he'd it was, have great advice yeah i mean in england as well you know not just blackpool yeah. he was uh, he was famous in, in, in fact uh brett in his, in his interview he met him on the exercise bikes and and uh, he was talking to Brett, telling him all these stories about who he'd played against all these players. And Brett's thinking, who's, 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 yeah, yeah, that sounds who's like this that. guy? And he didn't really believe <laughs> yes. a word he was saying. He thought he was talking a lot. Of, and then all of a sudden he finds out he's Jimmy Armfield. And, uh, you know, he had to obviously, you no. know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, he wasn't a bad player. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't bad at all. Uh, I'm just going to pop this in for me and Baron uh, because he often he, he's a 
is a, a Darlington fan, and he, we've already kind of touched on it. Ian, uh, he says, "Do you ever remember playing at the old uh, Beaton's Ground at Darlington?" But of course we do, didn't we? Because we've already touched on it. We got promotion there, didn't we? You know, we got into the playoffs there. So yeah. I, I was just mentioning it for Ian Barron because he's often in our stream. So it's nice to see you, Ian. Right, going back to our questions. Um, We've already touched on it, haven't we? Um, you've already mentioned Scott Scott Taylor, <coughs> and um, what what was he like playing with Scott Taylor? Because he was a cracking player as well, wasn't he? Really, was he something special when he came in? We used to love him. J James loved him particularly, didn't you? Yeah, I thought I thought we were very fortunate, really, because we'd had Brett, and obviously we, we we'd lost Brett, and then for Scott to come in and another prolific striker, it was it was pretty special, really. I think we signed Scott from uh, Bolton. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. it was or he'd been there um <clears throat> excuse me um but he scott came in and you know they're big boots to fill with brett as you said leaving you know and everyone wished brett all the best and he, you know we were so pleased that he'd gone on to to succeed how he did but scott came in and did exceptionally well he was he was fantastic for us you know he scored goals he worked hard he was a similar sort of player to brett you know he was you know really good and you know he scored goals which is what he was paid to do and you know, he didn't need two or three chances. One chance and he could score you a goal, which is what you need from a striker. And he fitted in well with John. You know, Big John was a great player. And, you know, he probably didn't get the, the plaudits that he deserved, John, because, you know, a lot of times he'd take the kicks and he'd take the backs, you know, the head is in the back of the head. And Scott yeah. would feed off him and get the glory. But Big John, obviously, you know, he was a good player and Scott, like I said, to be fair to him, fitted in fantastically well and a good lad, you know, because we had such a tight changing room. It was hard to fit in with our lads, but we made everyone feel welcome and Scott fitted in great with us. So it was, you know, it, it was easy for him, really. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next one we're going to ask you about. I, I almost can't mention this name with Jane, Jane around, to be honest. She, she has... She, it gives a nightmares. Uh, so, so I've, I've had my counselling now. Simon, I'm okay. I can hear the name. Simon Grayson, who um, joined as a player. What was it like actually playing with Simon as a player? And really? also on, 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 on the other side, he actually had one game as a player manager, didn't he? So did it change? After so, Maca left. After Maca that left. Season, I think there's one game yeah. with him as a, as a player manager. So what was he like as a player, Simon Grayson? With, ironically... He was at Aston Villa when I was there, and I used to clean his boots. Huh? So when he was a white, when I was at YTS, he was actually at Aston Villa, and I cleaned his boots one season. So ah, uh. obviously that when he came in the dressing room, and it was like, I was like, oh no, I'm going to get ripped. Because I know what he's going to say, and then every time his boots need cleaning, he'd go, "Come on, Tom, get them clean for us." You <laughs> <laughs> can do mine now. Do you know what I mean? But, so um, yeah, but obviously I knew him. <clears throat> so, but Simon was a good. Simon was a player that he could play left back, right back. He's a bit of a like Milner sort of player. He, I don't think he ever had a position, but he could play in so many positions. So as a squad rotation player, he, he was good for us because if somebody got injured, he could fill in there. And he was, you know, he had the experience. And although he was bulking up a bit at the time, you know, coming towards the end of his sort of playing days. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah, he, he was. He was good to have, and his experience helped us, you know. In, like you say, he ended up trying to be manager, I suppose, at one point would be the best way to Yeah, do. yeah. He, he wasn't bad the first time around. The second time, it's, it's not been quite successful. No. Um, also, um, as, long, as well as Simon Grayson coming, we got Peter Clark came in. Okay, Southern came in on loan. And, what? and they were massive players. We got Peter, Peter Clark and Keith Southern in from Everton came in on loan. And, you know, we just fell in love with both of them straight away. What sort of impact did they have, you know, when they came into the dressing room? Did the, we, we, you know, how was that for you guys? I think, it, you know, with McMahon's Liverpool sort of contacts, you know, he, he did used to get a couple of scouts lads in. Now, I always find with scouts that you know what you're going to get from them. They're going to they're gonna be hard, tough tackling lads that want to you know want to do well and want to win so yeah. they fit in great because we had the, the team spirit and Clarkie and, and Keith you know they look at Clarkie now old you know he's still playing for Tramway he is he's, isn't he yeah. he is, yeah they were great pros they they trained you know I know it's an old cliche but <clears throat> I managed to say train how you play but them two did that day in day out they were true pros hence why Clarkie's still playing you know because he's 
his love for the game was astronomical. He 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 really was a great player, and hence why he's still playing because he looks after himself and he, you know, yeah. he's still still doing really well, which I am pleased to see. I love watching him when he plays because he's he hasn't changed from when he was with us to with any other team that he's been at. So fair play to him. And as for Keith, you know, great lad, great. Yeah. Player. Yeah, I mean, we loved uh, both of those players, you know, equally as much. You know, we really did. You know, Peter Clark was a big fan's favourite at Blackpool. And he went on to good things at Huddersfield as well, didn't he? He went on to Huddersfield. Um, well, from fans' point of view, anyone that, and anyone that worked hard was a favourite. You know, yeah. they could see, yeah. you know, they had the worst game ever, but if they could see you running around too trying to do stuff, then I think yeah. that's any sort of fan. You know what I mean? If you can run around and show that you're willing to, you know, Put your put your neck on the line, put your head in where it hurts, you know. And black that's all Blackpool fans want, do you know? And that yeah. that will never change, I don't think, over the yeah, years. It's, it's funny, actually, we were saying that earlier, weren't we, about Jerry Yates, and you know that's why he's so popular because he just runs his socks off yeah, you know, for, for ninety minutes. minutes every game, and we don't know where he gets his energy from. But but we love him because we can see that he's putting that effort in, and, and yeah. yeah, it's it's right. Yeah, fans love players that you know, you know, that give it hundred percent on the pitch. It's it's one of the most important things, I think. You know, it, it it does create a massive bond with fans when we see players that you know give it everything. Yeah, um, the new stands opened, uh, and you we got like much bigger crowds. What was that like for you at, at the time as, as a team? Because you know we'd had the old bloom for row. You know we've talked about the dressing, you know the the baths and all the rest of the, and then we move. You know we build this half a stadium. Obviously, was it a big lift to the team there? A lot more fans in. You know we could get almost ten thousand in, and it was just and better dressing rooms. As better well dressing for you rooms, guys. I would imagine. Yes, it was ironic because like when we used to play, the sort of where you run out the tunnel, the old Bloomfield Road, and then to the right of that. I remember it used to feel like it was uphill and you were running and the, it was always waterlogged down that side. So I was dreading second half, running up the hill into the water slope. But it was oh. like, because the pitch moved across, didn't it? When the new stadium... Yes, they moved the pitch, yeah. They moved it across and it was like, wow, this is, you know, like a new stadium to us. It was sort of like, it didn't feel like Bloomfield Road because the fans weren't leaning over, standing up and shouting. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> from my point of view, I'd play in front of them first half and there was no fans the second half. Do you know what I mean? Because that's the way it, it worked. Yeah, the, the way it was, yeah. So we're still doing the other side. But, yeah, it, you know, to play in front of big crowds, is, you know, as a as a player is what you want to do. So when you go to away games and the, the stadium's packed, it gives you a lift. It, you know, you, you puts you under that little bit of pressure to to not embarrass yourself, really, to, you know, to play to your sure. best ability and, and show other people what you can do, show other managers what you can do. And, you know, maybe like Keith, um, not Keith, then um, Brett did, and try and progress. Although I dropped down to get back up again, which I didn't actually do. But you know, playing in front of big crowds is is what everyone strives to do. And we, you know, at Blackpool, you know, when the, the new stadium opened, it was fantastic because it it created like a better atmosphere, and it was you know it was brilliant. You know, it was fantastic yeah. to play in front of the crowds, and we did used to get good crowds at home. So it was, oh, and a lot of the away supporters used to come because they could have the weekend away. So. A lot of the away fans used to bring a lot of fans because it was like their weekend away. Our oh, wicket were playing Blackpool. We'll stay over for the night. So you know, we used to get good away crowds, which made better for you know a better atmosphere in the ground. Yeah, sure. Um, also, uh, in season three of oh four, Neil Dans and Jonathan Douglas came in. Did, from Blackburn. Do you remember them? What, yeah. what impact did they have on the team? I don't. Jonathan, I think didn't he, he played for Leeds? Didn't he? he went on to play for Leeds. Mm. And um, Neil still plays for. I think it's Jamaica. He's had a couple of games, doesn't he? I think, or I can't remember. He's still, play, yeah. he's still playing now. You know, they were great players. You know, any any player that comes from a top pro club, you know that they're going to be technically good. You know, it's just them adjusting to playing in men's football to playing. You know, like I played in probably more um, reserve games than I did first team games, obviously, at Aston Villa. But it was, when you come to, like, play at Blackpool, it was, you're playing for something. It, it means something to people. They're paying yeah. their money to watch you. And, it, you know, that's what you have to get into your head. Look, hang on a minute, this bloke's been at work all week and he's paying out of his pocket to bring his children and family to watch you play. Now, you've got to achieve, you've got to produce for them to, oh, wicked, I've had a wicked week, a brilliant week at work and I'm yeah. going to watch Blackpool and they've won. And, you know, and that's, 
for bringing in players like Jonathan Douglas, Neil Downs, you know that they're going to be good players. And again, they fitted in so easily with the, us because we had good footballers around them. So they were pleased coming in. We wasn't a long ball team by any count. So, you know, anyone that come to us, they knew that we played football. So them coming from the background they did, they fitted in perfect. <clears throat> Fantastic. So were there any particular players that, that you played with either at Villa or Blackpool that, that really inspired you and that you really learned from? Who, who are your sort of, you know, your... Obviously coming from a good <clears throat> pedigree background, you know, when you've got the likes of Gareth Southgate there and Eki even like when I did my, you know, going back to like early stages when I was in the, the before the youth team and the, the schoolboy sort of stuff, when you had legends like Paul McGrath there and you're watching these people day in, day out, and you're like, it's surreal that you're there, you know, looking back and you think, I used to train with people like Dwight York and Eki York and Southgate and people like Mark Draper and, uh, and you think, that's actually a decent achievement for somebody, you know, as a boy. Yeah, for sure. Oops, I think we've just lost him there, have we? Has he frozen? Tommy, no, I don't sorry. know. Ha, you've just it's frozen. So, so you're back, you're back. Yeah, sorry, I'm here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you just froze for a moment. I don't know why, but anyway, you're back. It's fine. Yeah, but like playing in front of those, so I, you know, I came from a decent sort of pedigree, and yeah. <clears throat> you just think to yourself, you know, wow, and you look back on your career and you think, actually, I'm not done too bad. You know, I've not set the world alight. I'm not by any means, you know, you know, living the dream as such. But you know, I had some brilliant times, and I've I've done a a decent sort of career in what most lads dream about. So you know, yeah. I think of myself in that respect you know so yeah yeah i mean you know you'll always be fondly remembered at blackpool you know you're a big you know a favorite with the fans for, for a magic time <clears throat> you know in, in well at the time i, I follow blackpool you know the, the, those those years that 2000 2004 will always stay in in my memory we're going to try this let's let's go <laughs> we've got another one on the isle of man did you go on the isle of man tour <laughs> was it do you remember that one should we just we'll, we'll just move on from there we? these are little james questions about the tours i'll tell you what you will remember here we go you're going to remember this the heat at qpr and we, we we played in a black kit do you remember we played in a black kit it was one of the hottest days ever Ever, and we lost, didn't we? And um, why does anybody know why Blackpool chose to play this this black kit? Because that was not our away kit is always a, you know the the opposite way around. So we'd be tangerine and white, then we'd white shirts and tangerine shorts. So. How much late? How much weight did you lose in that game? <laughs> I wish I could do it now, but no, yeah. um, I remember first game of the season. It is either like scorching or it's you know peeing down the rain. Or, and I remember, it's ironic because my, a couple of my dad's friends were um, QPR fans and my nephew's a QPR fan. And I remember the ball going out of play and we're getting absolutely stuffed. It is scorching hot. I'm absolutely sweating and nothing was going right. Everything we did, we just, you know, it just was a bad day all around. And I remember going to take a throw in and I looked up and it was my dad's friends that they're absolutely laughing their head off me. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't fun, you know what I mean? But again, at QPR, you know, you think of Blackpool at the time, we we were sort of sort of excelling ourselves really. We're like, wow, we're playing at QPR, you know, being the premiership at the time or uh, beforehand. And it's you know, it's great memories, but I just remember that game just for the heat. It was just probably the worst. And I was, was superstitious. I was wore a long sleeve shirt. Oh, so no, again, I, I had long sleeves, which is what like why I did it, I don't know, but I just one thing I always done is wear a long sleeve shirt. And I remember wearing them that day and I was like, what am I doing here? And I was like, <laughs> well, absolutely battered, sat on the bus for four and a half hours back to oh, yeah. It's a long journey yeah. back. A long journey back. Well, we're gonna cheer you up a bit. I, I don't know. Do you, do you remember beating Birmingham uh, City in, in the League Cup in that same season? Do you, do you remember, do you remember when that? they were top of the Premier League? I actually fell down the stairs the next morning. I was that excited. Yeah, they were top of the Premier League at the time. Yeah. Do you remember when that? You play, sort of everyone's game sort of seemed for some reason you obviously you want to impress and you want to, you know, think, oh, I might get a move here at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? So you, yeah, not that we like that but you just it just anybody that plays anybody in the fa cup or the league cup whatever it is you always seem to raise your game yeah and yeah i remember that game really well and beating a team like that is you know it's a, it's 
it's credit to ourselves and the credit the way that the manager puts the team out and you know fair play to the lads you know you go out and beat a team like that then yeah they, they brought a lot with them as well, didn't they? Because I think that was one of the first times we actually <laughs> sold out the Gene Kelly stand on 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 the left side, didn't we, against Birmingham? Oh, you know, yeah, the singing in the rain stand, and the, 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 you know there was a lot. Of, you know, the temporary golf yeah. stand that we had down that side. It took about yeah. eighteen hundred, I think, at the time. But they, you know, they filled it out, and it was. I remember it was a cracking atmosphere. I'm sure it was just a you know a wonder game. I suppose it wouldn't have been a bad move for you, would it, back to Birmingham? Being near yeah. Aston Villa, or would you not gone to Birmingham if they'd have picked you? Up? Would, would, would that have been? Yeah. Sometimes loyalty goes out the window, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. That's that. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone back to be fair. No, we're going to remind you now of the LDV, the next LDV run. You beat Tramir 3 1. You, you beat Donny 1 0, Stockport 1 0, Halifax. Town was a 3 2. We then had the Wendy's, Sheffield Wednesday. We beat them. Um, 1 0. Then we must have won 2 0 away altogether. And we played the final against South End. 2 0. Have you got any memories of those games? Is it can you remember anything other than the final? That's that's that shirt behind me. That game, it was ah, 21st okay. of March 2004. Yes, that was, that was when that was. So, yeah, yeah, I remember we was on the way down to Cardiff again, <clears throat> and something happened on the bus. And one of the lads said, Oh, it's so hot on here, so hot on here. And then, <laughs> I know it's not football related, but one of the lads opened, you know, the vents on the bus. Yes. So we drove down and it blew off down the, the motorway so we on the bus and everyone's like, oh, it's freezing now, it's freezing now. And we were like, oh, we're going to Cardiff. Everyone was buzzing, blah, blah, blah. And we've got this, all this <laughs> wind blowing through driving down the motorway. But, you know, and then you get to the game and you do the, you know, the, and every time we went to Millennium, we just knew that we were going to win this. It was just, you know, yeah, we just, we just knew, that, well, Obviously, you never know, but we were like buzzing that much that we had. I don't know if the roof was on that game. I can't even remember. But it was sort of like, it was, it was just wicked, wicked, wicked days out. You know, you're sitting there, the national anthem comes on. You see all the Tangerine Army all up in the crowd. And, you know, again, your family's all there watching. It's just proud, proud moments, really. You know, it, you can't, I say, you can't buy memories like that. You know, it, no. no matter what you do in your life, it's one of your... Your boyhood here is uh, memories to play in a cup final. Okay, it might is not the FA Cup final or something like that, but in the standard that we were playing with, it was still good to play in front. And there was a lot of fans there, a lot, a lot of fans there. And you're driving through the streets and they're all in the pubs and you're, you yeah. know, and shouting, it gives you goosebumps, you know, before you even get to the game. I've actually got goosebumps now thinking about it. Yeah. Know? I was just wondering what the feeling is like when that final whistle goes. And then, when, you know, you know, when you get up on the podium and they give you the trophy and the champagne's going everywhere. I bet it's just kind of surreal, is it really? Almost surreal. Like, it's memory, you know, you, you, you don't realize, you know, you're creating your memories and that, you, you know, you, you, you take them with you for the rest of your life. And, you, you know, it's, something to be proud of and something that you've achieved and you know as a team and you you know you gain mates from it and you, you still, I still speak to a lot of lads from you know Facebook and Instagram and things like that you know the lads are you know still I oh, will have to meet up again we'll all have to come up to a game and you know it, it'd be, yeah it never happens but obviously the, the good sort of times yeah. you, think, you know well, I played in a, <clears throat> a charity game Richie Wellams is there Jamie Milligan Brett um Barnes, you couldn't make it, but you know, it's just good to see lads, you know, good to see lads that, you know, and good to see lads that are still succeeding, like Richie's, you know, had a little go at managing, and you know, unfortunately, been sacked this week, but you know, yes, he has, yeah, but like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's good to see lads doing well for themselves and still in the game. Mm, I'm sure it is. I'll let you ask this one, Jane, because because it's, it's one for you, I put it down there. Uh, you, you like to bring... oh yeah brad jones he was he was like my favorite keeper before chris maxwell came and i remember he always used to terrify us because he, he he just called my hair in out for things but he, he was he, i really liked him for some reason just how did you feel as a defender playing in front of brad jones i was quite little because i was best mates with barnsey so i was like sad that he'd come in and sort of try to take his position so not that it makes any difference but <clears throat> brad was he was just a bit erratic to start with wasn't he, he settled down yeah. You know, you mm. think things, you know, like, all right, Brad, just let me head it. Do you know what I mean? I'm in a better <laughs> position, just relax. But, you know, he did do well. But I said I was, I was Team Barnes, unfortunately. But <laughs> <laughs> Team <laughs> Barnes. That's, that's it all, Jane. I'm sorry to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <Your> favorite. <laughs> 
Um, just going to briefly touch on. Oh, no, we don't want to briefly touch on this because this is amazing. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, when, Go on. Um, this is the big story. This is when, when Steve McMahon obviously famously resigned in the January and then had to backtrack. Uh, what you know? What happened there? And, and how was that for you as a player, knowing that your manager wanted to quit? And then kind of came back in the room, didn't he? There was a knock on the door and he had to walk back in and say, I'm, I'm changed my mind. Do you remember? Yeah, my, my, um, my contract was up. So I'd been in contact and quite a lot of contact with him because he was just sort of basically saying, look, <clears throat> you've been here four or five years. What What's your th thoughts? And I was like, <clears throat> what do you mean? He went, I'm off. He said, I'm not trying to influence you on your decision. He's like, what What do you want to do? And I was like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Do you want to take the with me? You, you signed me. Do you know what I mean? What's, <laughs> what's the track? And we're sort of like, <clears throat> you know, I'm not seeing eye to eye with the chairman. There's, He's making changes and trying to run the team. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, oh, you know, no. I don't want to get involved in that. I was here to play. And it became quite um, political. Do you know what I mean? It was sort of, I don't want to be here. He's forcing me to be here. And I just sort of like, well, I don't know. Just, it, it was weird. It wasn't nice. Do you know what I mean? Because we'd had so many great years and it was coming to an end, which is sad. Do you know what I mean? You, yeah, it is. You know, like, you know, you spend a lot of time with these guys, you know, you, you're traveling away with them every other weekend. You, you're with them more or less four or five days a week. It, yeah. You know, you build up <clears throat> a little family with them. Do you know what I mean? It's and it's it's not. You know, when I left, I was sort of like, oh god, you know, where do you go now? But luckily, you know, he said to me, look, I'm not going to sign. And I just thought, do you know what? Maybe it's done. It's served his course here. Do you know what I mean? No, <clears throat> went back to play for my hometown, Northampton. But you know, yeah, it was sad. And he he went and he came back and he had no decision. He was like, I don't want to be here. I told the chairman that but I'll do a job because I'm paid to do it. And it was sort of a bit like, oh, do you know what I mean? What do you say to that? So mm. it, was, it was difficult because obviously we'd had some good times and he was, but I think he'd, he knew that without a budget that he wanted, it was all going to go by the wayside, so, so to speak. Yeah. Sad times, really. So did he change then after, after he'd resigned in the January but wasn't allowed to go sort of personally? I wouldn't say he changed because he's a professional man, you know what I mean? But you could tell it's sort of not, for the want of a better word, not the stuffing out of him, do you know what I, th I feel? Mm. Because he wanted to go again. He wanted to build again. He probably wanted to rebuild the team. And um, if somebody's going to stop you doing that to the best of your ability, then I feel that, you know, he was, what's the word? Deflated, I suppose, for, for the want of a better word. And I, mm. He was still like, if when we went out, he would never go out and say, "Oh, that's just you know, don't bother today because I'm leaving or whatever." You, you, you know, you can't. Yeah, he still carried on being professional. He carried on being professional, but it was difficult for him. You know, even mm. things like mm, we used to have food after training, so it was his sort of way. Look, we train, we eat together, then everyone goes home because he thought like it'd be that little bit of bonding time. And then the chairman stopped with things like that. He stopped just traveling away and staying in a hotel, and it was sort of like, but. To get the mm. best out of everyone, you've got to do them little things. People might say, well, yeah. why don't you travel five hours on a journey to so-and-so and be able to play to the best ability? Because you can't. Because you know yourself, if you do a drive for two, three hours a day, you're tired. Sure, yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and that was, the, that was what he was up against. And him being mm. a and him coming from the background that he did, he wanted to do things right and he couldn't. And fair play to him, he just sort of said, enough's enough, I'm, I'm off. So, so you went as well. I went as well, yeah. So yeah, you went on actually. I, I, I had a little look at your uh, career. You played thirty-two games for Northampton. Uh, you played seventeen for Ro <laughs> <laughs> seventeen for Rochdale. Uh, Twenty-six on loan and a permanent move to Cambridge United. How did the career go then for you, Tommy? Because I think there was an injury Very as well. Slow, that was. It was sort of yeah, weird. it was a shame. Uh, quite quick. Um, I got. I remember. <clears throat> I signed for Northampton and had a real good year. And um, he said to me, look, your contract's safe. Sign it when you get back from your holiday. And then when I come back, Colin Calderwood said to me, Tom, I've blown my budget. I've got no budget. I'm like, look, we're four days away from coming back to training. My fault, really, because I should have gone in and signed it. But I was just sort of like, oh, it's in the bag. Don't worry about it. And then he signed Ian Taylor and um, <clears throat> blown his budget. And I was like, oh, that's me done. So luckily I was uh, a guy called Mike Milligan was looking after me, sort of a, not my agent, but sort of was helping me out. I knew him from playing around and he was friends. He, put, he came for, to Villa, didn't, um, 
to Blackpool and played a few uh, quite a few games yeah. for Blackpool. Yeah, you did, yeah. I sort of said to me, look, Tom, I've got some contacts in agents. Do you want me to try and get you something? I was like, yeah. It got me a two-year deal at Rochdale on decent dough, to be fair, but it was I'd played at home, so I'd been back home and moved back to Northampton. Then I was I'm not moving yeah. again. Do you know what I mean? My children had just started school, and I was like, I'm not. I'm not in a position to resell up, remove and, and do all that again. I said, you know what, enough's enough. And in the end, I sort of said to him, look, this isn't working for me. I, I was traveling from Northampton to Rochdale, three hours, training for an hour, training three hours back, uh, driving three hours back. And I was like, I'm just living in my car. Do you know, it's just, yeah. this isn't yeah, fun. This is what I, want. And I, I said to the manager of Rochdale, I said, look, I really appreciate you giving me what you've given me, but I'm not prepared to do that. And he was like, well, you can train with the kids and try to be funny about it. And in the end, he sort of, come to a mutual agreement i could go on loan to cambridge which is near me yeah and then when the loan was up they'd take me on and do whatever but i actually got injured there and stopped playing for two years and um, i did a small bone in my toe and i was like this isn't no fun and they said to me i was 30 odd and they said if you continue playing then you're gonna end up walking with a limp and i thought you know i don't want my children <laughs> no listen i'm not saying that it's bad but you know i did i thought you know what enough's enough and i I left and then my hometown of Kettering said to me, look, do you fancy coming back to play? And I was like, I had 18 months off, so I was itching to get out and play again. So I did a pre-season and actually played for those for two seasons. And we was like, got to the conference, we was in the conference north, then we got promoted into the conference and we was on the verge of winning the conference. And I got a payout from the PFA for being injured. And I was thinking, hang on a minute, if we get promoted here, I'm going to have to pay that back if I want to play in the league. And I was like, no. <laughs> Yeah, and then I, and I just went in to do a little bit of managing and so I played part-time, but it's so difficult. It's so difficult playing full-time and then playing part-time from having a job. Sure. To, to, I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't I couldn't get my energy levels up enough to perform how I wanted to perform week in, week yeah. out, playing and working. Part-time. It just couldn't work for me. It didn't work. So what are you doing now, Thomas? Well, I, I work for it. all about it. I work for a creative design agency called uh, All Things Management based in Northamptonshire where I head up the uh, print department. So anything that needs printing from business cards, water bottles, signage, clothing, promotional items, I sort of head up the department there, which is, you know, I really enjoy it. It's sales. You know, I like to be around people. And, I, you know, we work with a great team of designers, you know, videographers and everything like that. So anything anyone needs, then... You know, we're more than happy to help out and try and, you know, if they want not to anything, give me a shout. What sort of things do you print? Just, just you name it, we print it, basically, from, like I say, business cards, promotional bottoms, a bit of promotional All right. stuff. Oh, great, yeah. okay. Yeah. What's so the company called? All Things Management. All Things Management. I'll get a link off you and I'll put it in the video below. Uh, you know, you can send it me through on Facebook or whatever. And, you know, we'll put it in the link in the video. Um, can I interject with a supplementary question? Yes, you um, can. You mentioned Colin Calderwood there. Obviously, yes. he's back at Blackpool now. Uh, do you have any stories about him and what was he like? Because he's transformed Blackpool. Colin, you know, since he came in, it's been amazing. Colin was at Northampton. He was one of the first managers that <clears throat> was in. Uh, we used to wear like um, vests with heart rate monitors on, and yeah. he was sort of real, real professional manager. And <clears throat> obviously, I'm not saying that Steve McMahon was, but that's when I noticed the game of football changing. Mm-hmm. Where he was, we wear this, we get weighed before we go to training, we work out how much water we've lost to how much water we have to drink. We did injury, injury prevention training and really, really professional. And a real good coach. He had a good backing team around it. And I said, I really enjoyed my time at Northampton because it was a change for me. Obviously, being at home, it helped. And, you know, but I just feel that Colin, I, you know, although he, I feel he let me down by not signing me when he promised to sign me. But look, that's football. You know, I've got no hard feelings. I've seen him a couple of times since then and called him a few names. But, you know, <laughs> I feel like sort of uh. terms. And, I, and I've got utmost respect for him. And I think he's a great guy and a great manager. Or great coach, as they say. It's certainly sorted out our discipline since uh, yes, since he's come to Blackpool. We were, we were getting red cards all over the place, and then he's come in. It's like we're terrified now. Yeah, I think, you know, he was sort of a, a very, you know, he was a good defender and he was very professional on and off the field. And I think he's taken that into his managerial management sort of skills and, and basically gone from there. Do you know what I mean? So, I, you know, I, although I was disappointed in him and what happened, but I don't hold no grudges. It's, 
it is what it is. And fair play sure. to him. I hope he does a good job for Blackpool. Like you said, he actually is. So I'm really pleased. Yeah. For that. Yeah, he really is. Right. I'm just going to go to a few last uh, questions. You know, I'll go through the uh, viewers' comments because a few here. Um, Forever Football, uh, Peterborough United FC says, which Premier League club do you like the most? And I, I think somebody above asked the question, did you have a, like a favourite team as a boy? You know, who did you follow at the, at the time? So I suppose we can ask those two questions together at the same time. Yeah. Um, obviously, being at Villa, um, as I do, I look out for, I usually have a cheeky bet on a Saturday, Villa, Blackpool, Northampton, Rochdale and Cambridge and sort of like see my old clubs but my dad was a Man United fan so I know that probably goes out to a lot of people that don't like it but you know yeah. I do sort of tend to sway to Man United although am I that bothered no not really but I just sort of jump on the bandwagon and wind people up about it really just <laughs> well, no, well, but yeah it's probably if I followed one club I'd say United from, apart from my other clubs that I played for I do so yeah, you keep an eye on your old, your former clubs. A lot of players do that, don't they? Um, Frederick Abram, Freddie, you know, uh, said, uh, was there anyone who inspired you in football, Tommy? Was there any players that actually inspired you to be a footballer? Um, as I said, going back to Aston Villa when I've done my YTS days, I used to love the commitment and, what's the word? You know, the, just the commitment that like players like Hugo, Edgy, York, Sir Gareth Southgate, People like that, their work ethic to train and play was, you know, you look at people like that and you say, do you know what? That's why they've done so well. That's why Gareth Southgate is England manager now because he finished at 12 o'clock, but he didn't finish at 12 o'clock. He'd have his lunch. He wouldn't go home. He'd go and work on his left foot or his, you know, his yeah. past head in. And, you know, you look at people like that. And I was in the youth team. He used to come out and train with us. You know, he'd be saying, what are you doing this afternoon? Or we're doing this. I'll come out with you. And that's why he now is England manager. Yeah, that's yeah, why his dedication and commitment to the game is second to none. Yeah, well, they always said that about Beckham, didn't they, with his free kicks? He would be, you know, he'd stay for hours after taking free kick after free kick after, you know, and putting it in that top top bin every time, wasn't he? And that's why, you know, he took that wonder free kick at got and <laughs> qualified as on the it's in, in, in that game. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that commitment, isn't it? It's that yeah, going it's that. The players do well and, you know, the, the ones that train and work, you know, Unless you're exceptional and you, you know, this is, which is not many of them about people just listen, whatever you do, the more you practice, the better you get at it. And, you know, and, and fair play to those guys. And, you know, looking back, maybe if I would have been as committed to those and, you know, although you take that back and you look, that's why they, they stay in the game and that's why they do what they do because of their dedication that they put into it, you know, so yeah. fair play to those guys. Absolutely. Uh, Chloe Rebecca says, what was the biggest, well, we'll probably know the answer to this anyway, won't we? The, what, what was the biggest crowd you've ever played in front of? Well, I would imagine probably the Millennium Stadium, would it? Or have well, you played in front I, of the bigger? Oh, at Villa, you'll have played a, a bigger game. Well, I made a debut at Stamford Bridge, which I have to get in. It was a set up there. So I always say it's front of 40,000. So these are my, this is one of my work colleagues who's, I always swear them up. Oh, and they say, you're nervous. I said, what do you mean nervous? I played in front of 40,000. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of my sort of claim to fame. Oh, know. absolutely. That's one to have in the back pocket for any argument, yeah. isn't it? Uh, Alice Croft says, what a legend. Uh, <laughs> ben Thomas says, a great insight. What a top bloke. Uh, ben Thomas has said... Uh, Brian Thompson. Uh, sorry, Brian Thompson says, talking of shirts, did you have a, a favourite Blackpool shirt? Looking at the 2004 ones, I'm afraid mine would probably be the Nightmare Black one. I did have so. the black one myself. Oh, did you? Did, did you have a favourite shirt? About, talking about it today when I, I went round to my parents to uh, see them pick up one of my shirts. And um, the black one was a great kit to play. And it, it felt, I don't know why, it was sort of, because when I first went there, you know, every shirt was an extra large and you put it on and you, but sort of then they sort of made them a little bit to fit you. And you sort of, I don't know whether it was, it was that sort of thing, but like we, you know, I, I really did like the black kit. I know it was just different, I suppose, from yeah. playing white tangerine colors, which is great, but you know, it was just the continuity of playing in that black. And it was sort of like, actually this kit's quite cool. And you could get some colored boots to match it. And it was just something <laughs> I don't think we look good in black. Really, you know, we all look good in black. Yeah. That's one of the good things about black. It's just not good to play in on a 140 degree day or whatever at QPR. <laughs> 
Um, Sean P says, uh, great stream. What a top bloke Tommy is. Hope he can come back to Bluefield Row when we get our alarm back in. He would get a great reception from us Pill fans. Yeah, you would. So so many uh, have said when we've been promoting the stream tonight yeah. that, oh, you know, Tommy was my favourite player. So you, you're certainly very popular. Yeah. yeah. It's good to hear. Like I said, I, I can, I've got admiration for the Blackburn fans. I, they always supported me and I was always... You know, I'm not a local lad, so you know, I know it's quite difficult, but great, yeah. great times and that, you know, I uh, really, well, really that. It really means a lot to me that. Well, you're most welcome back, and I'm sure uh, John Cross would get in touch with you. I suppose you know Crossy, don't you? Who's, uh, yeah. who's in charge of the former uh, former players and everything, so he would have you back. And you know, you looked after for a game. You could do the half time draw and everything. I think it'd be, I think it'd be fantastic. You know, to see you back. Um, Brian Reed is that the Brian Reed? Oh, Brian Reed. It could be Brian. It could be actually Brian Reed, couldn't it? Uh, was the highlight? Of, what was the? Oh, sorry. Was the highlight of your time at Blackpool your regular visits to Brannigan? So it could <laughs> well be Brian Reed. Then good yeah, night, honestly. Big guy. Uh, what a what a legend he is. He'll be <laughs> we're a big big Rangers fan, so he'll be like, yeah. I, listen, I, I've got great times. At Blackpool, Brannigan's waterfront. You know, Yates is on the front. The Tower Lounge. We've been to them all, so I can't, you know, deny the times we had as as lads and probably a bit too well known for, with the bouncers at Blackpool at times. But, you know, we had some real, real good nights. <laughs> like, what, you know, what a town, what a place to live in. It was, you know, it was fantastic. You know, yeah, and Brannigan's was good. We used to have a, have a few nights of boogie. Yeah. <laughs> we went it was to Tuesday yeah. night, tracksuits on and. Yeah, it was a great venue. It was honestly, it was a great venue. I was out at that time as well. Uh, Peter Donnelly says, "Does that bet come in often?" Referring to your bet, and everybody, do you bet on them? Is it, is it worth doing, or do you bet against him? <laughs> well, the run Aston Villa was on for a little while. Now Cambridge are doing well. Then Blackpool started doing well. It, I don't think I've ever had it up, but yeah, I, you know, I don't really have bet that often. But when I do, I too try to put the, the teams on. But okay. no. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise people to put money on it. <laughs> this, this one cheeky pal says There's somebody called Steve Darby says, uh, Puerto, Puerto Banu in 2004. Does, does that mean anything or is that just a strange? We don't know. Does, no, does that mean no, 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 nothing I'll... about that? No. Uh, Man United fan says, what a legend. Ralph says, top man at Tommy. Um, Brian Reed again. Oh, Brian Reed. Boy, he's coming in with him now. Who do you prefer, Jamie Burns or Steve McMahon Jr.? Oh, there's got to be stories here then. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, look, listen, they were youth team players and we used to just sort of, I used to obviously be in a bit of a joke and we always just take the mic out. You're already here because of your dad. And then there's like Jamie, uh, so they used to live in the same digs together. So I used oh. to dig them out a little bit. So yeah, but no, to be fair to Brian, Jamie Burns, we used to call him Harold from um, Steptoe and Son. And uh, Steve McMahon Jr. was just used to go around kicking everyone and trying to prove a point that he wanted to be like his dad, really. But yeah, so yeah, great, great lads, both of them. So I wouldn't want to choose because it's, it's not fair on either and both good lads. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, diplomatic. Dipl very <laughs> diplomatic, yes. Uh, Freddie Abraham says, do you still have a soft spot for Blackpool? And if so, what do you think of the team? And will we get promoted? We've just got into the play. Well, I'd like, like to say, if they get to Wembley or wherever it will be at, obviously it will be at Wembley. I'd love to go down and, you know, watch them. Yeah, like I said, my time, my football career is based around Blackpool. The best times I had were there. So, yeah, I do have a soft spot for them and always will do for the the memories they created for me and my family. So, yeah, I do, yeah. And I, I really hope they do get promoted. You know, I really, you know, they've got a decent team. They're on a good run and they're, they're heading the right way. So, yeah, best of luck yeah. to the team for the rest of the season. You're a legend. You're already a legend. You're becoming more of a legend as, as the conversation goes on. Eugene McGeever says, what was your favourite ever film back in the day? Have you got a favourite film? Just get yeah. to the... You know what? Never. I'll tell you what it was. Annie. Do you remember Annie? I still love that film. <laughs> <laughs> We was expecting James Bond or something or some <laughs> Terminator or something. Annie. 
I can't believe I just said that. I think we'll, I think we'll, I think we'll edit this bit out, guys. What particularly was it about Annie that you liked? <laughs> no, I just like singing musicals and West Ham. Oh, will come oh, out tomorrow. <laughs> Bet your bottom we dollar like a musical that well, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, uh, Ray Cram says, what do you think of Neil Critchley as a manager? Do you think that was a great appointment for Blackpool? He's, he's been a bit of a mixed bag, but I think even uh, Blackpool fans who are not too sure are starting to really turn to him now as he's proving his worth as a as a great coach had you heard of him you know being the liverpool not really yeah. you know no. any managers judged on results and and you know if he brings in results and brings in success then you'll become a you know a legend of a manager which you know it's it's a tough job well, i always say to people would you ever go to management no i wouldn't because there's one thing sure you're going to get the sack you know and listen the guy's done well and you can't take that away from him you know he's yeah. doing well and let's hope he goes on to be a great manager and get promoted and move up the leagues as you know yeah. we'll promote the camp I'm aware we've had you quite a long time, so I'm I'm really yeah. going to kind of call this a, a, a day soon. I don't know if this is a, if you know this, Steve Darby says he actually lived with Tommy playing head tennis in the living room with Liam and Clarkie. Does, is, is that a story or is that, a, do you know That's Steve quite, Darby? Darby that, the name doesn't ring a bell, but obviously I do remember I lived in um, Roseacre in Blackpool and we had a fairly big lounge there and I do remember playing, playing head tennis. tennis in the front room. So, <laughs> Somewhere along the line, there is a true story in there. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's uh, that's all we've got for you, Tommy. We're out of questions. It's It's been absolutely marvellous. It's been a wonderful night. And I can't, you know, thank you enough for coming on this show. And you will be fondly remembered, you know, by Blackpool fans. Trust me, if you do come back and you do come back, you know, for a game and you come in, you know, hospitality. And we've got a new supporters trust. Uh, supporters um bar. bar called the armfield club now which is just across the road from blackpool and they're gonna have uh you know the former players are gonna be based in there and we're gonna be doing shows in there and everything so obviously if you you know if you do come up to blackpool we'll meet you and we're gonna do a show after the games as well there with former players and stuff so it'd be great to meet up with you sometime we you know we'd love it it's been a it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, thank you very much for your time and your stories you, yeah, yeah you, Really enjoyed it. You know, it brings back good memories. And, you know, like I said to you, I will treasure them for the rest of my life. But thank you guys. And I really do appreciate it. And thank you for, for, for helping us, you know, making those wonderful memories for us as well. It, it, it really means a lot to us. Yeah. Honestly, no. we can't thank you enough. I, I'm going to go to an outro, and you know you can stay behind if you want. We'll just have a little, little chat with you after. But uh, to everybody who's watched it, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've really enjoyed it. And if you're watching this on the rerun as well, you know, give the video a like. You know, when you watch it, and you know, obviously show your love for Tommy in 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 the comments on the video because it'll be up. You know, forever after this, you know, it'll still be there for people to watch for weeks and weeks and months and, and years to come. So thank you very much. Tommy Ashen, you are a Blackpool star. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.